Palisade Radio is brought to you by First Majestic Silver Corp., one of the world's purest and fastest growing silver mining companies. Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell, and on the line with us today is returning guest to the program, Brian London. He's the publisher of the Gold Newsletter and host of the New Orleans Investment Conference. Brian, welcome back to the program. Great to be with you, Colin. I think a good way to start out is talk about what's changed since you were on the show last, which is, of course, uh, a new trend forming for gold, uh, certainly a new trend for the gold stocks. And the context of our discussion today is uh, five charts that CJ over at Palisade Research, which is our research channel, put out uh, just this morning. And uh, it's a repeat of something we put out about a year ago. It was called Five Charts Showing Why Gold Stocks Have Never Been This Cheap. Uh, one year later, and I'm going to post a link to that at the bottom of this video. Uh, but Brian, you found these charts interesting, and maybe most interesting about it is um, the trend change that's shown. Uh, it's not really that significant yet, which is great. It means there's a lot of gains ahead. That's right. You know, Colin, the whole uh, genesis of this interview really is that you you guys put out this chart, those charts, the updated ones this morning. And I remember when you came out with them about a year ago, and they were very impressive. But the fact that you, you know, looking at them today and seeing what they say today, I commented, sent you, you guys an email saying, listen, can I steal those charts for a presentation I'm about to do? And you said, sure. Uh, and that kind of led to this interview. But they're, they're impressive and compelling because they show that we've had a long, long decline, really one of the the deepest and longest declines in the history of uh, these markets, these these very cyclical commodity markets, and that now we've confirmed a breakout from those ultra-low, historically low levels, and yet there's much more room to go. Uh, you know, what we were uh, talking about uh, earlier when I uh, first saw these charts is that this reminds me, and this is what I've told my readers in Gold Newsletter, that the current situation reminds me of 2002. At that point, the gold stock indices, the, really the major miners, had already doubled in, in value, and everybody thought they missed the big move. But in fact, we had years of really very powerful, uh, life-changing gains ahead of us in the resource markets. And, and that's right where we are right now. You know, the, the major mining indices have essentially doubled, and the, the companies that had identified resources already drilled off, uh, primarily gold and silver resources, have, have multiplied in value. So now what do you do? Where do you look for those really high potential gains now that the overall trend has developed and is confirmed? And, uh, and you know, that's in other metals, other markets, and uh, further down the food chain in the precious metals and uh, more exploration development shares. But I think the, the chart that you're really alluding to is the TSX Venture Exchange, which is a general proxy for this, this resource market, this junior resource market. And the chart that you put out really shows how long, how extended this decline was and how deep it was. But it also shows how far we can go just to equal the heights that we achieved in the last run. Uh, and it really reflects a multiple of where we are right now. Well, as you said, 2002 marked a great time to enter the mining sector, and the bull market continued from there and was prolonged for about another five, five and a half years. A lot of investors are questioning today what kind of bull market we're going to get, and this leads me uh, to uh, a bit of a macro discussion. Uh, we're recording this on uh, Thursday, June 23rd, the polls for Brexit are going to close here in just a couple hours. And it's unfortunate that we couldn't record this afterwards, but maybe we'll kind of uh, predict what could be the outcome if Britain decides to leave the EU and what could be the outcome uh, if they don't per pertaining to gold. What do you think, Brian? Well, the, the consensus, and I agree with it, is that it's obviously it's negative for gold if they stay in the EU and if they leave. It's a big positive for gold. I think that's been tilted a bit. It's not a 50-50 uh, a, a proposition or an equal gain, equal loss proposition on either side of that binary uh, uh, result. Uh, a lot of the uh, uh, risk has already been discounted. A lot of 
the, the, the gold has already discounted a remain result. So while we could be surprised really in either direction by what happens in gold, if the vote is to remain, I think that if the vote, the vote is to leave, that we'll see an outsized reaction to the positive for gold. And, you know, as, as we said, as you said, it's really too close to call right now. Absolutely. Well, Brian, assuming that assuming that they do leave the EU, um, you know, you kind of touched on this a bit, but do you think there's going to be a dramatic uh, upswing in gold? And, you know, a lot of times we touch on these events that can be positive or negative for gold, and they seem to only last for a couple of days, and then uh, everything's forgotten and the trend that was before continues. Yeah, I think the, the real story, the compelling driver for gold is completely divorced from this whole Brexit question. Uh, and that works either way that it, it may turn out. I, I don't think it would be a long-term positive for gold. The market uh, hates uncertainty and they tend to go to gold when there's any uncertainty in the markets, whether it's geopolitical or financial or economic. But in truth, the, the real long-term uh, secular driver for a gold bull market is always monetary depreciation. And that's what we're seeing worldwide and really to a degree we've never seen before. You know, typically you have one com one country devaluing its currency to uh, to uh, decrease the, the, the magnitude or the effect of its debts and they can do that in a vacuum. They can do that alone while the rest of the world goes about its merry business. But now we have every country, every developed country in the world pursuing a a policy of ultra low, even negative interest rates, deep, trying to depreciate their currency and depreciate their debts all at the same time. And when that happens, the only thing that they can depreciate their currencies and their debts against is gold, gold and silver, really. So that will be the long term beneficiary of the, the real secular trend that we see in place right now, regardless of what happens with the British referendum. Brian, you're a well-known newsletter writer in the gold space, and you have been for some time. I think it's fair to say that some a good bit of your focus is on the exploration and development stage companies rather than the producers, and that's the same for us here at Palisade. Uh, the reason being there's just so much more upside potential in these little companies, and uh, everybody, of course, wants to make money uh, when getting into the public markets. Um, I want to I wanna talk to you about a couple individual companies we happen to both be invested in and we can kind of talk about them individually but also in the context of uh, the greater market. Uh, one of them in particular is Arupa Minerals which is uh, primarily looking for precious metals uh, also some base metals in Europe and they're running a prospect generator model um, and they're raising money right now and uh, to tie this together, what a discussion we had before the call was the, f uh, the result of a dilution event right now is actually um, the amount of money coming in seems to out-trump the dilution is what we're seeing in the beginning of this, uh, this bull market. Can you talk about that? Yeah, you know, one of the, uh, not typical, but, but one of the recent reactions we have in this bear market is that when a company does a financing, uh, its share price weakens because of the dilution. But now when a company does a financing, we see that it actually is helping, by and large, it's helping the, the share prices of those companies because now they have the money to go about their business and continue exploration. And what happened in this long bear market is that previous to the, the, the uh, hibernation, as it were, of, of many exploration companies, they had done a lot of good work, a lot of good foundational work on outstanding, highly prospective projects. And uh, as it were, they, they, they rolled uh, the rock three quarters of the way up the hill, and then the market just disappeared. They couldn't raise money, and, and everything, or much of their work, essentially stopped. So now they have the money to go back and roll that rock back that little far, far distance up past the top of the hill uh, on a number of projects and in a, in a number of, uh, of companies. Now, Avrupa is, a, is an interesting company in that it's... Uh, exploring or focusing on one of these you know, wild and woolly frontiers of, of mineral exploration being Europe. And, uh, and it, it's not exactly unexplored, but it's, it's largely forgotten. And what people don't realize are that there are a number of outstanding uh, or highly prospective 
regions in Europe, uh, especially where Agrupa is, is focusing, that have proven mineral occurrences that have not really been uh, explored by modern methods for a very long time. And they've done a great job, even in the long bear market, of establishing joint ventures with uh, uh, very good companies to explore those projects. Another company to discuss, and I don't know as a director yourself if you're able to really talk about it, but I want to bring it up because it's really indicative of a bottom in the resource space, and that's Th Thunderstruck Resources, uh, which is looking at assets VMS project uh, in Fiji. Uh, it's a company I'm invested in. I know Bryce Bradley, the CEO, very well, and of course you're involved. Uh, it's a it's a company that hit a low of a penny at the very bottom of this. Uh, of this bear market, and it's now up to four cents, which doesn't seem uh, tremendous, but it's a 300% move. And you've seen this across the sector with a lot of these quality assets that uh, just hit ridiculously low prices. Uh, talk to us a bit about all these bottom companies that are really coming up and, and what we can expect from them moving forward. Yeah, and a lot of people, a lot of investors are going in and buying all of these sub nickel companies, just figuring that as the rising tide lifts all boats. You know, these things will get up to 10 or 15 cents just by uh, the, the being pulled up by the overall market, and that's an easy way to get these gains. But, you know, when you get down to those kinds of price levels, and they're really, uh, those aren't real markets. You know, at, at that point, your financings are typically above the, the share price and, and the like. But, but Thunderstruck in particular is a company I co-founded along with, with Bryce and, and uh, uh, Dale Walster, and it, it, we, we finally found, after years of looking, a really good portfolio of projects in Fiji. And to the, to the degree that we were able to acquire 4% of the, the main island of Fiji, in particular two proven discoveries by Anglo in the 1970s that were, uh, because they weren't porphyries, Anglo just uh, moved away and they've been lying fallow ever since. But in fact, what they are are, are, are high grade copper and zinc discoveries, uh, very high grade copper and zinc over mineable widths, uh, proven discoveries that just need to be expanded on. So during this bear market and very recently, we've been able to go in, acquire those properties, and we're in the process now of renegotiating our, our land agreements, which we feel will open us up when and if that's successful to joint venturing those projects out to some interested parties. So. We're very excited about what we're going to do, but I really can't talk about that much, as you say, being a, a co-founder and a, and a director of that company. Well, another interesting sector that we've both been following for quite some time is uranium. Uh, people like Rick Rule have stated that it's uh, fundamentally speaking one of the best investments because when something when an asset or a commodity's price on the market is below the cost of production, it's only a matter of time bef before things turn around. Even this week, I'm looking at the spot price of U308, and it's now dropped another dollar and eighty-five cents to twenty-six dollars and fifteen cents. My question here is, how low can things go? And a company that we're both involved in is Western Uranium Corporation, uh, which actually could benefit against its peers and has been benefiting as the price drops. Yeah, and you know, you, you bring up a good point. Rick was is excited about uranium again. He was also the first person to be excited about uranium in the last bull run. He'll say he was too early, but he was the first. And and it brings up the point that okay, we're in a we're in a uh, confirmed new run in precious metals in gold and silver, and for there to be excitement and interest and and really a uh, a euphoria in resources, I think it always has to be driven by gold. And so now we've set that up, but there are other markets, other metals that will have their own little bull runs within that broader trend. We saw that in the last big run in gold. We had gold take off in 2000, 2001. It went up through 2007, took a break for 2008, and then took another really big run to uh, 2011. Within that, we had a uranium mania uh, where you're, there were some 500 uranium stocks sprouted like mushrooms after a, a rainstorm. Um, and 
And lots of money was made in that little mini mania. We had a rare earth mania during that. So there's a lot of other little market opportunities that occurred during the big trend. Uranium is going to happen again. We see that at some point over the next two years, the price should rise considerably as utilities forward contracts for uranium supplies run out. They're, all, they're going to start running out over the next year and it will get critical over the next two years. So the, the price of uranium seems almost assuredly to respond to that. Now, more specifically, what attracted me to Western uranium was their ablation technology that they have patented and, uh, and constructed uh, these ablation, this ablation equipment that pre-processes very cheaply uh, sandstone-hosted uranium ore and upgrades the uranium content, which dramatically decreases the processing costs. And, and they have uh, a, an established uranium deposit. They have permitted uh, a mine permitted. They have uh, permits for a mill, which they have not constructed. But in the meantime, they have a toll milling agreement with a mill owned by uranium fuels. So they, they're really set up and are just starting out to go back into production and exploit this new technology they have. Uh, the one drawback they have right now, and the reason why I haven't recommended it in Gold Newsletter yet, although I have recommended it in my alert service, is that there's not a lot of float. It's very, very tightly held. Now, this translates into real, much higher upside potential, but it's very difficult to get positioned in the stock currently. Uh, management is addressing that, and I think you'll see some financings coming up that will loosen up the, the, uh, the share float and give the company the capital it needs to really get moving. Well, Brian, you were talking about mushrooms sprouting up in the past bulls of rare earths and uranium. Mm -hmm. I could even throw graphite and a couple other commodities in there right. that I recall. Without question, the gem of the commodity business for the past 9 to 12 months in terms of gains in the public market has been experienced in lithium. And that's right. a lot of a lot of it's been driven by Tesla's rise and Elon Musk. Uh, there's obviously market opportunity here. Nobody wants to be caught at the end of a cycle, but these cycles typically last uh, more than nine to twelve months. And there could be a tremendous amount of upside left in the lithium space. What would you say to investors interested in looking at lithium? Uh, I would say a lot of them have have made really big moves, and I, I would be wary of those. Would you? would want to look at are companies that are in obviously safe political regimes um, but that are that at earlier stages and you need to look at them as highly speculative investments uh, there's a lot to lithium exploration and development and production water being a key component of, of the whole process so there, there are a lot of uh, boxes to check off as it were but for taking a flyer on some early stage plays um, you know, I, I think it, it could be a good opportunity in the right situation. One of the companies I recently participated in a financing for was Iconic Minerals and hadn't had a chance to do much due diligence on it and haven't yet and it's had a really big run. Uh, so I haven't recommended it in uh, any of my uh, letters or, or publications as of yet because it has had a big run and, and I tend, obviously I want my readers to get in at the best possible price. But that's one that, that is, compared to a lot of the plays that have already moved, a company at a fairly early stage and seems to have a very interesting deposit that would have results in the near term, uh, drilling results in, in the near term. Well, Brian, finishing up, I want to talk about something that uh, people were questioning before this bull market started, and, and, and part of this question is being answered already, but the idea of all commodities moving together, there was kind of one camp that thought gold, silver, and platinum and palladium could move in an inflationary environment where there's not actually much demand for commodities. Um, I was always of the opinion that the inflation would drive the price of all these commodities up regardless of demand, things like copper and zinc. Um, you know, e, uh, uh, many of the base metals, and uh, it's hard. It's hard to kind of put a finger on what is the the correct way to look at it. Um, you know, gold's obviously started to move, and some of these base metals are moving with it. Do you think investors should be positioning themselves in things like copper and zinc uh, and tin? What's or would you stick solely to the precious metals and some of these other commodities we've mentioned? I, I think copper has an interesting story. I think. 
if you look at uh, the range of metals and, and, and how they typically move in markets, uh, copper would be one of the next metals to move. I think zinc has some special circumstances in, in that market. It's already uh, appreciated considerably over the past couple of months. Uh, so I think there's some opportunity in looking for zinc plays, either resource play, uh, development companies or exploration companies. But for the base metals, the big story is and, and will be, as long as we're alive, I believe, will be China. Uh, what's your outlook? What, what is an individual investor's outlook on China? And uh, that was the big driver for the 2000 to 2011 bull run in metals, or in base metals in particular, was the, uh, uh, was the rapid growth of China. So in, until you see, I think, a, or can be comfortable with an outlook that includes a, uh, uh, another uh, surge or another level of growth in the Chinese economy, I think that's what you're really looking for in the base metals. Okay, and final question for you has to do with what they call the summer doldrums quickly approaching. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a, a theory that based on the amount of financings that have taken place, and there, sh there sure have been a lot uh, over the last couple months, that the timing this year around could be a little bit different. Can you explain? Yeah, I, you know, my work on the timing in the metals and the, and the uh, junior stock markets has shown that any time from, say, mid-July through mid-August, the market typically reaches a bottom. And that if you buy in that level and you're at the lows during that time frame, you typically get a 10 to 20 to even 30 percent jump on the rest of the market, which typically doesn't really get gone until going until uh, mid-September or so when, when people get back from their uh, summer vacations and really get to work. Uh, and, and that has generally coincided with the seasonality in gold and silver as, as uh, uh, fabricators get ready for the Christmas season and there are a number of festivals in China and India. The, uh, but this year, I think it may be a bit different, especially for the junior equities, in that these financings that were done in, uh, to a large degree in May and June, those are going to come free. The restricted paper from, from those financings will free up in September and, uh, and October. So I think that the low for the juniors, or at least a buying opportunity for those junior miners and uh, uh, development companies, will come in the September to October time frame and that investors really need to look at that closely uh, as far as timing and uh, there should be some buying opportunities emerge. Now who knows what the, the general level, the overall level of the, the broader market will be at that time, but relative to, to the uh, broader market, a lot of these companies I think are going to have buying opportunities develop around them. All right, well, Brian, thank you so much for coming back on the program. How can our listeners get more information and subscribe to your newsletter? Goldnewsletter.com, very simply. And if they want to learn more about this year's New Orleans Investment Conference, it's neworleansconference.com. Brian, thanks for coming on the program. Great call. Good to be here. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen? Are you too stupid? 